Hey guys, and welcome back to the Fairway Performance Podcast. Uh, today, I'm really excited to bring a guest to you uh, all the way from the US. Uh, I was recently on his show, uh, and we've been chatting a lot in, in recent times. Um, we, we've formed a really good connection uh, over golf, uh, as all of you have. And um, his name is Mike Leonard, or Michael Leonard, and he is a golf author, and uh, or author of uh, Wicked Smart Golf, or creator of Wicked Smart Golf, and he's also a golf writer. He left his uh, career, previous career, and I'll let you uh, talk about that, Mike, and um, and tell us how you got into Wicked Smart Golf. Um, but firstly, did you want to give us a quick little intro as to who you are, where you're from, and, and what, uh, what got you into golf and, and golf writing? Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks again, Sean, for having me on. Super excited. That was uh, really fun chatting with you about all things golf fitness. So excited to share with your audience. So I started playing uh, this crazy game about 25 years ago. Uh, so I definitely feel old when I say that. Uh, but it's been quite a journey. So again, my name is Michael Leonard. I grew up in Oregon, uh, played very unsuccessfully for two years in uh, college down in Southern California, and then uh, moved out to Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, after graduating and really took a big break from golf. Uh, it wasn't until 2016 when I uh, booked a trip to Pebble Beach with my family. We had a, a whole bucket list kind of trip lined up and we booked it about six months in advance because Pebbles, uh, obviously a lot of travel and, and getting all the reservations and they really uh, make you plan ahead. So we had about six months and at the time I was working in a corporate national sales role at Yelp.com. And I really loved the job, but, you know, I just felt like there was something more out there for me. And at the time, I was kind of getting back into golf. And uh, it was just one of those things where I was like, if I'm going to go play Pebble Beach and Spyglass, like, I really got to get my game together. I'm not going to pay $500 to, like, <laughs> shoot 85 out there. And so the golf bug really bit me hard again. I, I played every day in high school. I mean, I didn't, I didn't even barely have friends. All I did was live at the golf course in high school. So I took a big break from the game for seven, six, seven years. And so when, when I got back to it, I just instantly fell back in love with golf. And soon enough, I was going before work. I was going at lunch to putt. And as soon as the clock hit four, I was driving like fast and the furious to get to the golf course and play nine. And so... <laughs> By the time I got to Pebble Beach, ended up shooting in the 70s, shot 73 at Spyglass from the tips, and really just fell back in love with the game and kind of realized, like, hey, I got to get back into competitive golf. There's just nothing like it. Um, and I just really wanted to see how good I could get. And so about six months after that, I had uh, really been planning my escape from the nine to five. And so I've been saving and, and building online businesses and trying to figure out how to how to make the side hustle work. And so by April of 2017, I put in my two weeks and uh, haven't been back to a, a nine to five since then. And uh, I can share my golf writing and everything else, but golf really was one of the reasons I wanted to quit my job because I wanted to at least see how far I could get. I wasn't really sure if I could become a professional at 29. I knew the odds were totally stacked against me, but I didn't want to, you know, wake up one day on my you know deathbed or when I'm 80 years old and be like, man, I wish I would have tried at least. And uh, so that was kind of always my driving factor. And uh, yeah, I come from an entrepreneurship family, so I really wanted to see how I could figure that out as well. And there's never been more opportunities. And so it was really cool to uh, figure out a way to piece together golf and uh, just my passion for sharing advice with others and freelance writing and a lot of the other projects we'll talk about today. Yeah, man, that's so cool. And um, you commended me on on your show for for quitting the um, the military and, and chasing my dream. So um, good on you, mate. It's so good to to see other people in this space. Um, you know, one we're brought together by golf, but um, also business and um, just trying to help others and, and making that into our livelihood. So good work. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was quite a quite a risk at the time. People were like, what are you doing? And uh, definitely got a little bit of hate from some family, friends, coworkers, definitely my boss. But, uh, you know, I just was like, gotta, gotta bet on yourself sometimes. Yeah. And like, no, no one, no one can really um, tell you what to do with your life. It's, um, you know, it's, I read a, a book called um, Five Regrets of the Dying. It's written by an Australian lady who was a palliative care nurse. Have, have you read this? You, you're nodding. Oh, yeah. Brownie Ware. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing book, you know, and she talks about one of those things, um, you know, or th there's five things, obviously, but one of them is um, you don't want to be laying on your deathbed and, and wishing that you had a tried something, you know, whether that was a job, a career, like whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, if you're thinking about it uh, as a listener to this show, um, 
don't just quit your job straight away because we said so, but um, have a crack. Like, you know, we only live once. We've got a limited time on this planet. And um, yeah, you may as well do something that you enjoy, even if it doesn't pay a million bucks a year. Um, but you know, never know, you might make it into a million dollar job. Yeah, that uh, book is amazing. And like you said, it's it's better to make half as much and enjoy your life and, and not have to have that weekend dread and those Sunday scaries heading back into a job and actually have a business and, and life you love. That's That's pretty exciting. 100%. Uh, cool. Well, that aside, what we're actually going to talk about today is uh, is course management um, because, um, correct me on the terminology here, but you're a, a mental golf coach. Is that uh, the correct way to say it? Mental go- yeah, golf coach yeah, certified? So I got, yeah. So I got certified as a mental golf coach last year uh, and I published my book last year. I started the podcast, Wicked Smart Golf. Uh, so everything under that name last year because I've been writing about freelance or I've been freelance writing about golf for quite some time, published a short book in 2017. And uh, really for me, I just was you know going through this process of trying to become pro and going out there all the time, being at the course four, five, six, seven days a week sometimes. And, you know, I'm writing about golf, I'm talking about golf. And just the biggest thing I just kept seeing so many times is just these little mistakes people make that are just costing them so many strokes every single round, both with course management and the mental side. So I eventually got certified using the mental golf type system last year because I found so much success using it. And that's a that's separate than the course management stuff we'll probably talk about. But you know, there's just so much of golf that has to do with non-swing stuff. And everyone focuses on swings and training aids and hitting all these jumbo bucket of balls. But, you know, at the end of the day, you can have a great swing and just have an off day. But if you don't have a great mental game and can't make decisions the right way on the golf course, you're really going to struggle and you're just going to throw away shots. And there's nothing worse than having this great swing, but not being able to put together a good score. Yeah. And I'm glad you said it um, there. Um, we're going to like the, the thing that we'll talk uh, about the majority of today is going to be course management and, and how people are wasting shots or, or how to, you know, plot their way around the course a little bit better. So um, did you want to give us a like set a bit of context here? Like what is course management? Um, like what things are we considering or talking about here in, when it comes to course management? Because we hear that term thrown around a lot. Yeah, and I actually re- reframed it in my book as the whole section is, is just playing wicked smart because I hate the term course management because to me, that just means it's when everyone hears that, it's like, oh, I just have to hit three wood. I'm just going to aim for the middle of the green. You know, I'm just I'm not going to have any fun because I'm just going to be playing so safe. And it's like when you really start to study the uh, numbers that are on the PGA Tour and, and read books like every every shot counts and all these different ones that analyze so many stats – you just realize there's so many things that you can do to you know change your scores without changing your swing and so that's really where i just wish people would spend some more time kind of walking through their shot and really understanding the lie and the rough and where they should be aiming you know most people just kind of get up there they see their ball they use a range finder they hit the flag they pull a club and they go it's like we really don't have any time to process it and really work backwards. And so to me, course management is just making better decisions on the golf course. So that way you're playing the percentages and not trying to play hero golf every single time you tee it up. Yeah. And having a, having a system, I think, is a big thing there. A lot of people don't have a system, um, so they don't really know. Um, and I think it was uh, I think it was John Sherman when I interviewed him. He said, uh, because we're not picking specific targets or we're not picking particular things, how do we know if the result of a shot is good or bad? Um, all we have to go off is we're aiming at the flag and we didn't hit the flag, um, which, you know, it's not really a, um, a good feedback mechanism to, to be trying to do that. Uh, so course management, we've defined sort of what it is or, or your definition of it. Um, what do you think the keys to good course management are? And how can golfers practice and develop better course management or create a system around course management? Yeah, I think it starts even before the round uh, to really go out there and have a game plan. So one of the biggest things that I talk about a lot is just having the right expectations. So a lot of people go out there and they say, I want to play good today. I want to shoot a 75 or I want to shoot an 84, whatever they're trying to do. And they just put this pressure on themselves immediately. And while it's okay to have goals for golf, I think if you go out there and you're going to say, hey, I'm going to make 
uh, or I'm going to shoot 79 or I'm going to have my best round ever. Like you're just putting unnecessary pressure. You really cannot control those things. And so instead, what I like to have people do is set birdie goals or set par goals and set something a little bit more tangible versus like, oh, I'm going to play the best golf ever just because you're putting so much pressure on yourself before you even hit the first tee shot. So I think that is really the first thing. And then the second thing is to have some sort of game plan for the round. So a lot of people, you will either use a golf GPS or yardage books, or, you know, in my case, I really geek out and go on Google Earth before tournaments and really kind of set a plan and go through my practice rounds. And so obviously it's going to be a little bit different from competitive golf versus just going out with your buddies. But to me, it's just not playing overly aggressive and trying to fire at every single flag. But to me, it really just starts before the round, just saying, hey, I'm going to go out there. I'm going to execute every single shot, one shot at a time. Uh, and we'll talk probably a little bit about that, too, because so many golfers just get so ahead of themselves or really dwell on the past if they have a three putt or a double bogey. And so staying present and having that sharp mental game is also really key in just playing consistently, which if I ask any golfer, it feels like everyone just says, I want to play more consistently, whether that's shooting in the 90s or shooting in the 60s or the 80s. Like everybody just wants to play more consistently because there's nothing worse than having a great round and then going out the next day and shooting 10 or 11 shots worse. Yeah. Well, John, John Sherman actually talked about that. He said um, that every golfer, and it was one of the, um, one of the posts I put up or one of the little clips I put up out of our podcast. And he said, every golfer has a, a 20 to 30 shot swing in them. Um, when, when he says that we're talking about uh, Richie Wierenski, who a lot of people probably don't know, but he's a top 100 player on the tour. And he, at the players, I believe it was, he shot an 80 in one of his rounds. I think he made the weekend and then shot an 80 on the weekend, like 76 and then 80. Uh, but the week before that, I believe he shot a 62 at whatever the previous tournament was. So that's an 18-shot swing for a PGA Tour player. Um, you know, that's a huge difference. So do you um, – what, what is it for you? Like how, how big can your swings be? Because you're a, a plus two marker. So like give, give the listeners a bit of an idea about some of the, the better rounds that you can have and then also some of the worst ones. I know yeah. we don't like talking about the bad ones, but um, we, we have to know that they're there. Yeah, they're definitely there. And, and really, to me, it's it's learning from them. And so, like, for me, I would, you know, I play in a lot of tournaments, 60, 65 tournament days a year. And so I would say, like, as a plus two, I think my average was maybe 72, 73 in tournaments last year. I think I might have had one in the 80s, a couple, you know, maybe five to seven in the 60s, uh, mostly in the 70s, you know, low 70s, mid 70s. But to me, I feel like, you know, you're always going to have swings. Of course, Some, sometimes you're going to have days where you just don't feel good or, you know, your body's not into it. I mean, we're all going to have those kind of ups and downs. But to me, I feel like there's so many things you can do throughout the round to play more consistently. And I'm sure we'll cover those today. But obviously, swings happen. Golf is a pretty stupid game, but I love it. Uh, when those bad days happen, though, you got to expect something good to happen the next day. And so having the right mindset is huge. So even when I'm slapping it around, playing terrible, I always try and just focus on one shot at a time, not get ahead of myself. When I was younger, I was the uh, absolute worst at this. You know, I would have maybe a bogey, bogey, double start or something. And then all of a sudden, my mind would race to the end. I would say, I would think about shooting an 85. What are people going to think about me? You know, self-talk would just go down the drain. I'm a loser. I suck, all that stuff. And now if I start like that, I actually kind of reverse it. And I'm like, well, we got those out of the way. Like, you have to expect you're going to make bad swings. I mean, I would say in a given round, even as a plus two, I probably only hit seven, eight shots that I'm like exactly how I imagined. Really, golf is just a bunch of good misses with a few good shots, hopefully a few putts drop, and – you have a good short game to me. I mean, but there's just a lot of days where you're going to go out there and, and you're not going to hit 100% of shots perfect. I mean, even when Jim Furyk shot, what, 57, 58, I'm sure he missed a few shots even in there. So I think that having having that perspective and being able to mentally shift when bad things are happening is key because I think a lot of golfers do have that ugly start and then they just just slide down that hill the rest of the round. They just totally give up. When you need to be able to take control of your mind, you need to have routines in place and you need to have that kind of mental wiring. So that way, when things do happen, you're able to bounce back because that's really going to be the difference from someone that's having those up and down rounds versus playing a little bit more consistently. And the thing is, you just never know what's going to happen. I mean, I've had rounds where I started off awful and ended up birdie, birdie, birdie to finish broke par. Like you just never know what's going to happen. And so 
I wish people would stay mentally engaged throughout that 18 holes a little bit more and not just say, oh, I had a bad front nine, you know, whatever. It's a lot of times when they do that, then they actually have a great back nine because they stop caring so much. They stop thinking and overthinking. And so having that perspective and, and ability to shift in the middle of the round is huge. Yeah. And I've been talking to a friend about this recently because he's just gotten down to single figures and he he would sort of let a, a few bad holes sort of get in his head a bit and, and blow out. But I just reminded him like, cause I don't know whether he actually, cause he was a member at my club and he's, he's moved to another club now, but um, I, I don't know whether he played in this club champs round with me. I don't think it was, but I, I was explaining it to him. I'm like, look, I went bogey, bogey double to start the second or third round of the, the club championships, whatever it was. And um, anyway, so I was like four over through three holes and, you know, I could have been the worst day that I've, I've ever had on the course and I could have kept going down that bogey train and whatever else. But for the next 15 holes, I went three under. So I went, um, you know, four over then three under for those, um, those two respective parts. Um, so I finished one over and my handicap was like three or four at the time. So it was a really, really good round. You know, I could have let the start of it, um, you know, the fact that I'd already used up all my shots for my handicap at the start, um, get into my head. Uh, and he was finding that he was doing that at the start of the round. And, you know, the front nine, it wasn't until recently that he shot, I think it was 10 or 11 over on the front nine. And then the back nine, he had one over. And that mm -hmm. was from missing a three footer or something. He ended up shooting one over for that nine. So he ended up having about 34, 35 points at the time. And uh, I said to him, I'm like, look, you, you can turn it around. Like, you know, you've just proven to yourself that you can shoot almost even par for nine holes, even though you're off, you know, nine, 10 handicap. I'm like, that can happen at any time. And it's probably when you just like gave up caring about the total score because you knew it was going to blow out anyway. And there was something going along there mentally that you just sort of gave up, maybe gave up all hope or just, just stopped caring about the result too much and just focus on the next shot and, and having fun in between. Um, but in, in saying all of that, uh, just as an example, um, what, uh, and that's a, a mistake that we see with, with golfers, what are some other sort of course management mistakes you see? Cause obviously, you know, letting it get in our head is sort of a mental and a course management thing. But, uh, when talking about course management, what are, what are mistakes or like top three or four, two, three, four mistakes that you see, uh, amateurs make when they're playing with you? Yeah. And, and one thing too, just about the bounce backgrounds, like you talked about or having the bad front nine or bad start and then finishing strong, like you and your buddy did, you got to write those down. You got to like record those because the mind loves to remember negativity. We have negativity bias programmed in us to survive. And so it's real easy to remember the shank, the top, the bad shots you hit, but it's also really important to remember all those positive memories, all those great shots, all those days you started off terrible and finished like a champ. Like you want to remember those. I log notes and everything more than just stat tracking. Literally, sometimes I'll just open my phone and be like, hey, we really finished strong today. And I'll like walk myself through it because you're going to have slumps in the future. You're going to have those days. You need to be able to bounce back on something. And a lot of times your memory won't always be there for those good rounds. And so having some sort of backup is huge. So again, I'm a big fan of documenting your wins. So that way you can be like, Hey, even though I'm going through a bad time or had a bad round, I'm still a really good player. So just wanted to include that. So that way everyone can remember yeah. those good ones. But I would say Love it. one of the biggest uh, mistakes is, is thinking that three woods, the play, you know, so many golfers are like, Hey, I'm going to hit three wood. This is going to be, this is going to be my fairway finder. You know, I was just reading a study on um, golf monthly. I think they partnered with Arcos and uh, they found that the, I think it was a five handicap. Uh, when they were hitting driver, found 49% of the fairways. And most golfers think, okay, 49%, like one out of two. Well, you got to compare that to the pros. The pros hit, I think it is 60% of fairways. So they're really not hitting that many less fairways than the pros. But then you think, oh, I'm going to hit three wood. That way I'm going to hit the fairway more often. Well, that study found that they only hit the fairway 3% more of the time. So it's like, that's actually a terrible idea because not only are you giving up distance, you're really, I mean, you're not going to find the fairway that much more. And I'd rather hit driver and be 25 yards ahead in the rough versus that 3% chance I have of hitting it in the fairway, because just st study the stats. I mean, you're going to hit, you're going to have a higher uh, stroke average from farther back. I mean, if you're hitting it longer and people are doing speed training and working out and all the things you talk about, it's going to make golf easier. And I say that not just from like, Oh, this, you know, Sean said it and everyone else is B training. I know because I used to be a very short hitter. When I was in high school, I was four feet 10. 
I hit it my fr- my freshman year. I shot 124 in my first tournament. I hit the ball about 170 yards. Golf is hard when you're only hitting it 170 yards. Now I'm hitting it 100 plus yards past that. And so it's a lot easier. You'll figure out how to play from the rough. We're not playing like US Open rough any- everywhere you go. We're not playing like super tight fairways. So take the driver more often. You're going to have less into the green. You're going to have better chances of hitting the green. You're going to have just better opportunities. So to me, that's one of the biggest course management mistakes is people thinking three wood is the play. And it's even worse if you're hitting hybrid or five wood or some sort of long iron, because then you're going to have like 40 or 50 yards more. And so people obviously are, some people are very terrified of their driver and they, they avoid it. But If you really want to become a consistent golfer and you really want to hit your golf goals, you have to make your driver your best friend. And you have to practice with that thing because even if it's not finding the fairway all the time, it's going to set you up for success on 14 of 18 holes. So you got to make that and your putter, to me, two of the most important clubs in the bag. Yeah, 100%. And like I've had a whole host of guests that have like said the exact same thing. Adam Young, John Sherman, uh, Scott Fawcett, who you've also interviewed, um, all of these guys say the exact same thing. You know, promote the ball further down the fairway so you have a shorter iron in. Um, what are some considerations that we, uh, in course management, that we would take for not hitting driver? Like what circumstances would arise where uh, we don't want to take driver out of the bag? And, um, you know, what, what does there need to be for that to be the case? Yeah, I mean, there's definitely got to be out of bounds and or maybe water on one side, hazards or um, OB on one side, water on one side. Like it's got to be very narrow. So, again, you have to think about shot dispersion. I'm sure Scott Fawcett talked to you about that, too. It's just important to realize that, of course, you're going to have a shot dispersion, even on your best days, even if you're a professional golfer, you're still going to miss it left and right. That's just golf. And so unless it's like a super narrow fairway, I'm hitting driver. Like it's just going to be the play most of the time. But again, you have to figure out like if there is trouble on both sides, that's really the only time I'm thinking like, okay, maybe three wood, maybe hybrid. But again, that's really where having a yardage book, having a GPS, maybe doing some research beforehand can really help you out because a lot of times it might feel more narrow because you see that trouble up there and you kind of make it smaller and shrink it down in your mind. But if you actually have a yardage book, you have that GPS in your cart or you've done a little research, it does make it a little bit easier to get up there and swing with confidence. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And um, the the thing that Scott talked about with it was essentially if we're going to hit our first shot off the tee and there's a chance that our dispersion brings into play OB or water, then we don't want to be reletting our third from the tee. So we might lose a bit of like 0.5 of a shot or something because I don't know the exact numbers, but we might lose 0.5 of a shot for not hitting driver off the tee and we're hitting a three iron into the rough or fairway. Um, but that's still where net ahead of where we would be if we were to hit driver OB. So, um, yeah, from strokes, I think OB is, OB is the biggest advantage. thing we want to avoid. You know, it's like water is not the end of the world, depending on where you're going to have to drop at. But yeah, OB is really the, the uh, kryptonite, if you will, for the driver. That's the time where, you know, if you got OB on both sides of it, absolutely, especially if it's a narrow fairway. But, you know, the biggest thing I talk about, too, is when you're on tight fairways, like we have to a lot of people try and guide their swing. And I just I think that when you feel like it's narrowing down and you're really trying to guide it, you're going to make this little controlled swing. You're going to get overly mechanical and you're rarely going to hit a good shot. So if you are going to hit driver on a tight fairway or you are going to hit that three wood and it might be a little bit more of a risk, to me, you got to commit to it. So many golfers kind of half-ass it and they're like, uh, I'm not sure is it driver, is it three wood? Like whatever you do, like the whole part of your pre-shot routine before you start walking up to the ball, you got to commit to your target. You got to commit to the shot because if you're going up there with any doubt in your mind, that is going to influence your swing, especially on those tight fairways. Anytime we try and guide it, you're just never really going to hit that committed swing. So I just want you to go up there and have 100% confidence. It's kind of like reading a putt. You know, you want to go with your gut. If you think it's going left to right, play that thing left to right. Don't walk around three times and say, is it left? Is it right? Is it, you know, you got to commit to it ahead of time. So that way, when you're standing over it, you're going to have that confidence to execute and trust your swing. Yeah, hundred percent. And if you're hitting driver more, you're probably going to get better at it. So why not? <laughs> yeah, I think people just are so scared of their driver, and I, I get it. I mean, I've I've definitely struggled. To, again, I've shot in the hundred and twenties to in the sixties, so I, I know golf at all levels. And the one of the things though, they they're so scared of drivers because they never use it, and they they think that somehow it's magically going to get better, and they think, oh, I'm just going to aim more left to play this slice. It's like you got to commit to really loving that club, and that means practicing more with it. I mean, there's so many great clubs out there that will make golf a lot easier too. So getting a custom fit driver, I think that 
You don't need to get custom fit for every single club in your bag yet if you're shooting in the 80s or 90s, but you want to make sure that you have a custom fit putter and a custom fit driver and not like spending thousands of dollars, just making sure the loft and the shaft are right for you because you can make little adjustments with those uh, club weights and sliding weights and the hosel that will literally help you 10, 15 yards sometimes. And that's going to help give you that confidence. So a lot of people just have the wrong equipment too, and that's making golf even harder. So even the beginning of my chapter talking about course management, we'd say, hey, we got to get the right gear because if your shafts aren't right, if your loft isn't right, you're kind of screwed from the start. So getting that under control is huge. And with new clubs coming out every year, you can always buy the old ones and, and save a couple hundred bucks too. I mean, they're still going to be great clubs. So that's one of the two clubs I think we should constantly be updating and just making sure that it's fit for your swing and your swing speed. Yeah, hundred percent. Couldn't agree more. And um, so that's the that's the first mistake. What what other mistakes do we see? So number one is uh, taking three wood off the tee or, or less than driver. Uh, yeah. What's the what's number two? Oh man, so many. Um, to me, actually, <laughs> I think we should we should actually rewind before even thinking driver or anything. To me, it's not having a great pre shot routine or any pre shot routine. Because really, if you if you look at all professional golfers and high level amateurs, they all have a pre shot routine. They don't have the same pre shot routine at all. I mean, everyone's different. I mean, I was just watching the Farmers Insurance last weekend, and I'm blanking on the guy's name. Who Sam Ryder? I want to say he had one of the strangest routines I've ever seen, but it was his. You know, it worked for him. Tigers is different than Phil's or Sergio or anybody else, but they all have a pre shot routine. Because when you have that sort of consistency, it's going to help you walk up to the golf ball with confidence. That is just one of the things that all pros have in common. But again, there are some similarities in terms of time-wise. So uh, in the book, I believe it's uh, by Mike Bender called Golf's Eight Second Secret. He talks about all, he basically studied the, some of the most successful players. They had had at least five major championships under their belt. So again, these are the best of the best. And he found that all but one swung a golf club in under eight seconds from the moment they stepped into their stance and actually had their stance ready and got to follow through in eight seconds or less. If you go out on a driving range or you go out on a golf course right now and time and, you know, a guy that's shooting in there, maybe 20 over something like that. I think the average handicap is 14. So let's say a 14 handicap. I guarantee you he's taking 10, 15 seconds sometimes, especially on those difficult shots. So to me, course management starts with building a really consistent pre-shot routine. And it's not just synonymous with golf. I mean, think about in the NFL, the field goal kickers, they have a routine they go through. Basketball players, when they're on the free throw line, they spin the ball, they dribble. They're getting their mind ready and they're getting their body ready because they've practiced this. And that's one of the biggest mistakes I see with most golfers. They just have no pre-shot routine or they have one that's so inconsistent, you can't even call it a routine. And so there's a lot of things we could break down into that. But to me, we got to have like different parts of your routine. So that way, again, you're standing over it with confidence because you and I both know there's nothing worse than standing over a shot, second guessing yourself. You're like, is this the right club? Is this the right shot? And, and, you know, and you start thinking too much. Then you're going to take 10, 15 seconds. You're going to let doubt. You're going to let those mental demons get in there. And you're really just going to make golf even harder than it already is. So to me, I always tell everyone, hey, develop a pre-shot routine on the driving range. Like when's the last time you saw someone just take a small bucket at the range and go through and do their pre-shot routine for every single swing? Chances are not, not often. I mean, I was at the range today. This guy had a jumbo bucket. It was obnoxiously big. He just was rapid firing, never working on his routine, really struggling. Again, he was just making a lot of these practice mistakes that are just making golf harder. But to me, it's practicing with purpose and making sure you have a routine. So that way, when you are playing well, or when you're not playing well, is especially when you need your routine, you're going to be able to have the right thought process. You're going to be able to get in the zone a lot more, and you're just going to be able to swing with confidence because if you're doubting yourself over any type of shot, usually that just comes from not going through your step-by-step -step routine and uh, committing to the shot and the club that you want to hit. Yeah, hundred percent. I feel, um, like especially with the the people that I play with or playing in the like just the club tournaments that I play in a lot on weekends or, or during the week, I find so many players don't have it. And when they see a player that does have it, they sort of get the shits with you a little bit because they're like, oh, why is he taking this time? Like why is he standing back there and looking where he's going to hit it and then like walking up and doing this thing and – it's like it's almost like it annoys other people to see that, and I don't know. I don't <laughs> probably know if because it's... they're probably because they're getting beat by that guy who has the routine. 
<laughs> yeah, like maybe there's a bit of jealousy there or they just don't have one and they just don't know how to do it. Um, how, like, how did you, how have you set up your pre-shot routine? Like what's some advice around um, setting up a, a good pre-shot routine? Like what factors are you taking into account? Yeah, it's a great question. And to me, there's there's two parts. There's the conscious mind part and there's the subconscious mind part. So let's keep it real simple. So the first step of your routine is analyzing the shot. So let's imagine that we already hit our drive. We got up there. We're uh, hitting our second shot into a par four. So the first thing when I get up there, you know, again, here's the routine of most people. Most people get up there. They they laser the flag. They pull their club. Maybe they take one practice swing next to the golf ball, look at the target a couple times, then just go at it. There's really no thought process. There's, you know, sometimes it's five seconds. Sometimes it's 10 seconds. Sometimes again, it's 20 seconds if they're standing over it. Like think about Sergio Garcia back in the day, he would just like take forever and ever. And so if you really watch those nervous shots, people tend to get very time lengthy and they're just thinking about it too much. So to me, we got to, to not take time and actually be efficient over it. We got to analyze the shot. So the first thing I'm looking at when I get up there is I'm, I am checking the lie above all else because your lie is really going to dictate what you're going to be able to do. If you're in a fairway divot, if you're in the fairway, if you're in the rough, those are all going to be different things and those are going to impact your target so first thing i'm always checking is the lie and specifically the stance is it going to be uphill downhill side hill so you want to start that way so that way again we can figure out what kind of shot we need to hit into the green then from there i do of course hit the range finder and then hit the flag and then i try and work backwards so if i'm up there let's say we have 150 yards to the flag and it's a back flag well, if it's a back flag, you don't want to miss long because you're going to short side yourself. So really the goal with your approach shots are to always never short side yourself. If you really look at Tiger, one of the reasons he's so great is, of course, his swing, his mental game. He's an expert course manager. He literally always misses in the right spots. And, and you hear guys talk about that, like, oh, I missed in the right spot. I missed in the right spot. That's usually just not short sighting yourself, not giving yourself a really hard chip shot. So we have to start there. And so, for example, let's say it's 150. It's a back pin. For me, that would be pretty much a comfortable nine iron, but I might actually club down a little bit or maybe choke up on that nine iron. So that way I'm going to hit in the middle of the green and then it can scoot a little bit back there, but I don't want to play overly aggressive. So first thing I'm always checking is the lie. You also want to think about weather too, of course, wind, is it cold? Cause the ball's not going to go as far and you want to get, you know, this is your conscious mind. This is your analytical part. This is where you kind of want to geek out. And it might sound a little intimidating right now, but like the more you do this, the more it becomes, this is just, you know, rapid fire. You're instantly able to, just figure out exactly the the wind, the elevation, the the distance to the flag, where you want to miss, where you don't. And so it becomes pretty, pretty you know, systematized. And so once you figure that out, then it's time to say, okay, we got the distance we want to hit. So let's say for this example, I got 145 yards. The pin is 150. I want to hit at 145. Anything past 150 is kind of going to get me in some trouble. So that's when I think, okay, then I pull the club. Unfortunately, most golfers get out there and they just fire at the flag, then they pull the club. But again, we always want to work backwards. And so from there, then I would think about my target. And so target selection is huge. I think most golfers aim at the flag way too much. Uh, if it's not in the middle of the green, it's probably not the best idea in most cases. You know, I think for if you're shooting, let's say you're the average golfer at 14 as a handicap of the average male golfer. I really don't think you should aim at the flag unless you're probably inside 120 yards if it's you know tucked behind a bunker or behind the lake or whatever it is like a lot of players play way too uh aggressively and i get it you know you have a, a less than maybe 120 in or you have 130 you think this is my time i got to take advantage of it but again we got to think about like where you're going to miss you know shot patterns even the best players in the world miss greens from 100 yards 120 yards and so that's where you got to figure out your target and so for me you know, you might say, hey, it's between that flag stick and the middle of the green, if it's maybe 140 yards. But we really want to think about that and then get super clear about your target. So for me, target is step two. Once you have your target dialed in, you have your distance from step one, then you want to make some good practice swings or rehearsal swings. The problem is most golfers just get up there and they make these really lazy swings and they don't really mimic what you're going to be doing on the actual shot. A lot of golfers that do it at like 20% speed or they won't actually, you know, kind of involve their lower body at all, or they'll just take an air swing. But, you know, you're, you got to program your mind for what you want here. So this is kind of the point where you're trying to really visualize. And a lot of people can't really visualize. Like, for example, everyone says visualize the shot. I can't visualize anything. I've never been able to see a shot tracer up there. So for me, I try and feel it a little bit more in my hands. I, I like to verbalize and say, hey, I kind of see this going, you know, off the left side of the green, kind of cutting in. So everyone's mind is different. And that's that's really the beauty of the, the mental golf type system is you got to like figure out your personality type. 
Um, but for me, again, this is the point where it's like, okay, I'm committed on the distance. I'm committed on the target. I'm committed on the swing. This is, I, I got my swing. Now it's, it's, it's game time. And again, this sounds like it takes a while, but this was literally 10, 15 seconds. Once you get it all dialed in, then you got to walk to the golf ball. Hopefully at this point, you already have all your homework done. So that way, when you're over the ball, you're able to just swing. You're able to look at the target once or twice and execute. But the problem is, again, most people skip step one and two, and then they're thinking about that over the ball. That's going to lead to 10, 12 seconds. A lot more doubt's going to come in, and you're just not going to commit. So you really want to give your mind a clear picture. Jack Nicholas always talked about that. He said he never hit a shot, even in practice, without fully concentrating on what he wanted to achieve. And so that's going to be different for everybody. But to me, we really got to get super clear on it. So that way, when you do go through that routine, you're basically able to kind of hand it over to your subconscious because it just comes automatic at this point. You know, when those guys are shooting free throws, they've done it so many times in practice. When they go through their routine, they're firing and wiring their same things in their mind. So it just becomes automatic. And that's what you want to do on the golf course, because we don't have to react to the golf ball like we have to react in other sports. And so having that routine and walking through it is huge. But everyone also forgets the last stage, and that is just to accept it. Whatever happens, we got to accept it. Because how many times have you hit a bad shot, and then all of a sudden you let that bad shot linger, and then you hit another bad shot, and then you hit a bad putt, and now all of a sudden you made a double bogey because you had one bad swing, but mentally you let it affect you more and more. So that's always the last part to me is have some sort of ritual to just say, hey, the shot's over. You know, That could be putting the club back in the bag. That could be taking your glove off. could be exhaling. Having some sort of trigger to be like, all right, time for the next shot. Yeah, I love that. That's, so that almost falls into a, a post-shot routine, isn't it? Like it's pre and then post is, is letting go and doing that. And the post can obviously go further into, you know, diving into what happened. Yeah, because I mean, think about it. Like it. if you try and stay focused out there for four or five hours and you're just like locked in all day, like you're going to be mentally zapped. I mean, I've had those rounds where I walk off the course and it feels like I went to work. I'm like, why am I so tired? You know, because you're thinking all the time. It's like, we got to have some sort of like ending ritual. So that way you can think about other stuff. And then once you get close to your ball, then you can start kind of getting in that performance bubble and really figure out what we need to do. But you got to take some time in between, talk about life, talk about whatever, talk about anything other than golf sometimes, just to give your mind a little bit of a break. Because as I went through, that is kind of a mental intensive little session there for each shot, because you got to give it a little time to recharge in between. Yeah, hundred percent. I love it all. The my pre shot is pretty much identical to that. The final thing I do is literally after I've done all the analysis and the, the geeking out, like you said, is pick a target six to ten feet in front of me, make sure the club face is lined up at it, you know, fire away, and then um, I really use the the post shot to help with the rest of the round. So if I keep missing things right, like I'm blocking at a touch or I'm like fading it a little further, almost turning into a bit of a slice. I'll literally just factor that into every other shot from there. I'll be like, cool. Like today my miss is a little bit this way. I won't try and change my swing. I won't try and change anything. I'm like, cool. I'm just missing it a little bit right today. So I'm just going to aim here. And I literally did this last week, uh, playing with a friend who was going for a handicap and he shot in the nineties. Um, and it was a past 61 course. So it was a really, really short course. And the first three, four holes, I was one over. And I was like, oh, I keep missing everything bloody right today. Like I'm blocking it and it's just you know, just going straight right. I end up shooting two under. So I shot a 59 for everyone listening. Nice, 60s. there we go. Yeah, so I actually shot a 59, but it was on a past 61 course. So I don't think that counts. All right, it's, all right. it's still 59. Uh, yeah, but um, like from there on, my wedges and irons were just dialed because I was just aiming a touch left of where I wanted to finish. And a couple of times I blocked it more than I intended, but I still was aiming further left, so I hit it perfectly. Um, but that was the power of my post-shot routine and actually figuring out like, what is my miss today? What happened there? Where was I aiming? And I got feedback on it and I was able to implement it during that round. Um, then, you know, I can come home and hit balls in the net at home and actually figure out like why I was hitting it right and, you know, do all that analysis and watch yeah, the arts that's... hand and that sort of thing. But it's not, um, it's not for the golf course to do that sort of stuff. No, yeah, I was going to say, you got to just swing your swing. You have that day. Some days you're going to be stiff. Some days you're going to be playing a draw, even though you normally play a cut, stuff like that. So totally get that. I think that's great. And having to make mid round adjustments is huge. You, you have to learn from every shot you're when you're out there, but I totally agree, man. I, I hate thinking about technical swing thoughts out there. Some types of players might benefit from it, but some players like myself would absolutely not. And anytime I start thinking mechanical or technical, 
again, I'm just thinking too much when I'm over the ball and I'm not just letting go and, and doing the thing I've worked on the range for, for 20 plus years. And so getting out of your head, I mean, I think having one swing thought is okay. I think a lot of people need some sort of anchor when they're out there and maybe it's just something I like to think of like very non-mechanical swing thoughts, like smooth tempo, but you know, you don't want to be thinking like, Oh, hinge my wrist here. It's like the more technical we get, the more it's going to be kind of hard to just let go and play golf. And so I hate to see people out there like playing their golf swing versus just playing golf. Yeah. Even uh, like one of the things that I've employed lately where you say just one swing thought has just been like to trigger my actual swing starting and I'll like, literally just push my left foot into the ground a little harder so I don't sway in my swing. I found myself doing that a bit recently. So I'll just dig that foot in a little bit harder, not heaps of weight, but just enough so that it like leverages me to pull back in the swing. And that's literally all I think about is uh, lined up, done all my stuff, left foot, bit of pressure into the ground as I pull the club away and then everything's fine. Everything goes fine. Yeah. Um, You gotta, you gotta have a, a trigger. Yeah, I think that having a trigger is huge. I think a waggle is really beneficial too. Ben Hogan talks about the waggle in his book so much. If you really look at most really solid players, they have a little bit of movement because think about how hard it is to swing a golf club at 100 miles an hour if you're completely stationary. Like if you just have no movement to go from zero to literally 100 plus miles an hour, it's really hard to do. But if you're over the ball and like if you watch long drive guys, they're the epitome of this. They're moving their legs. They got waggles. But I mean, even if you're not a long drive guy and you just want to play, you know, your waggle sets up your backswing. It gets that motion because if you're standing over the ball and you're not moving, you have way too much time to think. You're keeping your body very stiff. You're going to get tense. You're not going to be able to really have that free flowing swing. So for me, I get up there, like you said, I, I look at my intermediary target. I get into the ball, I look at the target, then I do a little bit of a waggle, confirm, and then as soon as my head gets down and the club hits the ground, then I just go. Like that's my trigger for me, and I just don't want to be standing over the golf ball. So yeah, I think if people can have some sort of trigger, it can be the weight thing like you mentioned. I think that's actually really good because swaying is a a big issue for a lot of people. Actually, something I worked on today, so I like that tip. Uh, But yeah, having some sort of like trigger so that way we're not just sitting over the golf ball for a couple extra seconds, it's really hard to generate that speed and and have that free-flowing swing that you want. Yeah, cool, man. All all great stuff. Um, so we've talked about we only got to two because you had so much to say about them. So that's I, I'm that's so fine. passionate about the pre shot routine. <laughs> I had to actually include one last part, and that's to stay loyal to it. So many golfers, yeah. when their round goes to you know you have that bogey bogey double start, it's like whatever. But it's like that's the time when you need your routine the most. That's when you need to have that alignment. You want to just keep your mind in the right place because, again, the routine helps the mind. It helps your alignment. It helps your setup. You know, a lot of times you don't make bad swings. You make bad setups. You may have poor alignment or whatever it is. And so your routine is there. It's your friend. So you got to train that thing on the range, and you got to stay loyal to it, especially when you're playing bad. But even when you're playing good, you still want to stay in it. So. Yeah, I'm a big, big proponent of that just because I've I've seen it in my game. I've seen it in so many others. And again, if you just study the best players in the world, they all they all do it too. Cool, man. Now, we talked a little or we've brought up a few of the uh, factors that play a role in course management. Um, but did you want to go into some of the like weather and environmental factors that, that play a role in, in course management? Yeah, definitely. I think there's a couple of things. Obviously, when it's windy out, you really got to be respect the wind. Uh, you got to got to make sure that you're having the right game plan. Uh, if it's into you versus downwind versus side hill or side wind, like that's a big factor. And to me, I don't we don't get to practice in that. You know, you have to like when, when it's really windy out, most people don't just like drive to the range. But yes, wind practice. So you're kind of <laughs> out there like guessing a little bit. So, of course, that's something you want to factor in, especially with the lie. So, you know, if you're on an uphill lie or side hill lie and it's going to go right to left and then the wind's going right to left, like you really got to practice or you got to really think that through a little bit. So, again, that's where I think the routine comes into play so much more because you can always take longer behind the golf ball when you're going through that analyzing process. And that's a great time to like really dial in like the wind, the weather. uh, And that way you can then, again, walk up to it. But it's okay to spend more time back behind it. But again, once you're over the ball, that's when you like that eight seconds or less. But another thing too is moisture on the golf ball. You know, a lot of times if you're playing in the morning versus the afternoon, depending on where you live, like that's going to play a big role too. 
because like when there's moisture on the ball, you're not going to be able to get the same spin rate. So if you're chipping, all of a sudden your little, your little bump and run or your little chip shot that you might get a little juice on, it might hit and then roll out just a little bit. Now, all of a sudden that thing's going to hit and really release. So you got to change your landing zones. You got to really be thinking about uh, the humidity as well. Sometimes if the air is really thick and heavy, same with it's really cold. So Playing at time of day, I think, is huge because I remember watching Phil Mickelson on David Faraday back in, uh, I don't know, five, ten years ago. And he was talking about that because he's like, people say, oh, I hit my, you know, seven iron 160 yards or whatever. It's like, do you always hit it 160 yards? Like, if it's 30 degrees, are you still going to hit it 160 yards? Or if it's 100 degrees and you're in Arizona, are you still going to hit it 160? So wind and weather are absolute factors. Um I don't really have any like general rules for it. I think, again, it just comes down to making sure you're thinking that through uh, with your pre-shot routine and making sure, again, you can spot these things, you know, when you're analyzing it and you're going through all that. So that way you're just not uh, not making silly mistakes by just being like, oh, man, I forgot. Yeah, it's it's really hot out. The ball is going or, oh, man, it's really cold. I think one of the biggest things, too, with like right along those lines and course management is just people need to club up more on approach shots. If you really look at most golf courses, most of the trouble short, the water, the deep stuff, the sand, most of the trouble short. And unfortunately, most golfers try and hit a club that they have to hit 100% perfect to actually work out. And I mean, like I said, I'm a plus two and I probably hit seven shots around and I'm like, perfect, absolutely nailed it. So you have to figure that you're going to miss some shots, maybe 70, 80%, you know, versus hitting it 100%. And so if you're always having to hit shots perfect just to get on the green, you're going to leave yourself in some really tough situations. So that's one of those things where I just wish people would put the ego aside. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have no problem on a par three, seeing a guy hit a nine iron and I take a seven iron. I, I don't care. Like so many guys get involved in watching their competitors and not playing their game. Who cares? Like in high school, I rocked a seven wood, man. I had no shame in the game. Everyone else is hitting like five irons and, and six irons. I'd hit my seven wood, but you know what? It was going to be right for my game. I was happily playing with enough club and playing with clubs that would actually help my game. So to me, I just wish when it comes to that course management, got to club up a little bit because even if you do hit it good and you hit it too good, you might miss a little bit long, but you're probably still going to be on the green. If you go a little bit long, Again, the most trouble isn't long. I mean, how many times do you see guys miss in the water long? It's always the water short. So I wish that people would factor in, hey, you know, I'm probably not going to hit this 100%, especially higher handicappers. Like, that's just how it goes. I'd much rather see someone take an extra club, choke up a little bit, have a little bit of a knockdown, controlled swing. You're going to hit more greens. You're going to have more birdies, and you're not going to short side yourself from in the in the bad stuff short of the green. Yeah, I actually played, um, now that you say that, it like it just brought back a memory of a recent round. I played at a golf course called The Coast, which is uh, right on the coast of, uh, of Sydney here. And um, it gets very, very windy there and the conditions can be, you know, pretty torrential at times. Like it's crazy, sort of like Pebble, but um, way not as nice a course as Pebble. <laughs> um, but the conditions can be the same, like big southerly winds, like strong winds, that type of thing. And uh, we we're playing this par three. It's uh, it's on the back nine. It's around like the fifteenth or something. If anyone's listening has played there, and it always plays into a northeast wind, like northeast wind in Sydney in summer, in, or the east coast in Australia. Northeast winds are the prevailing winds, and they're always like really strong in the afternoon, like thirty to forty kilometers an hour. So you know, twenty to thirty miles an hour, twenty-five to thirty-five miles an hour. Um, and uh so anyway i've i've choked down on this five iron playing a i think it was like 150 meter hole 160 meter hole i've just choked down on this five iron just hit it to the center of the green and this old guy's like oh what were you hitting a five iron for and then he's pulled out his seven which he normally hits that far and he's ended up like 25 meters short and i'm like that's why <laughs> and he's like oh yeah he just couldn't comprehend that he couldn't hit that club that far like literally and if he can dial in some of those mistakes like instead of playing off 22 like his handicap was he, he might yeah. be playing off like a 15 you know D yeah don't be fight much more wins. enjoyable I mean, game yeah like like he said there like you gotta you don't fight it like a lot of people whine about it like it's not going anywhere just because you complain about the wind like you have to figure out how to adapt and sometimes that means taking a club that you would never take from that distance but who cares? Like I said, there's no, they always say, of course, no picture on the scorecard. Like no one's going to remember that you took two more clubs than anyone else. Like they're going to remember that you played better than those people. So yeah, having just the, 
the ability to make better decisions is just so key. And uh, I wish more people would not compare themselves to anyone else. Like I said, if me and you play together, I'm never once going to be like, oh, you hit six, I should hit six. Like, that's just not going to help anybody. And I remember Tiger would talk about that. He would show people what he was hitting just to like mess with them because he's like, you have no idea what I'm doing with this seven iron. I can take 20 yards off. I can put 20 yards on like he can do anything. And so you really never know what anyone's trying to do, what kind of shot shape they're playing. If they're hitting a knockdown, hitting it high, whatever. So yeah, play your game, swing your swing. I think that's one of the most important things in golf and course management. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, just on that, uh, what are some of the, like, how do people sort of, mentally get better in course management like we talked about you know the mistake of trying to keep up with mates or seeing what club other people hit what are some other things that people fall into like trying to outdrive mates um potentially it's not a driver hole for them but they pull out the driver like are there any other uh things like this that you see yeah like like we said play play your game i think that should just always be like your if you have a yardage book like just put that on there you know what i mean like swing your swing play your game i think that should just always be the vision for it um and i think like another thing too is is with uh like keeping your mind in the right place like i said our mind loves to wander and it's really easy to make bad decisions when your mind isn't present with you if you just three putted and you couldn't believe it was 20 feet and you just three jacked like i just did this in the tournament i had like a 12 footer literally it was such an easy putt i just jammed this thing by all of a sudden i have three and a half feet come back lips out and i just had the ugliest three putt ever and i was like wow that like old me would have just lost it probably broke a club you know just been and would have affected the next shot and the next shot got up on the next hole went through my routine stuffed a wedge made a 15 footer just like that i'm back i'm like man that is so important because i did not let my mind affect me and i you know so many people just you know when you're playing good or bad let your mind really get the best of you you have to stay present so one of the things I learned from a sports psychologist, so before I went to Q school in 2019, I, I definitely felt like I could really improve some mental stuff. And I remember talking to him and he's like, this is so simple. Just wear a rubber band on your wrist. So anytime you feel your mind wandering back to the past or back to the future, just snap that thing. Just have some sort of little trigger. I know it sounds like super easy, but it and just kind of almost silly, but it makes such a big difference because how many times have you been on a tee box and you're still thinking about that three putt? I remember in a tournament that I was playing in last year, this guy made an ugly quad at the beginning on the second hole of the day. The next day we're on that hole and it was, we had the same pairings the first two days and he's still talking about it. And I finally just lost it on him. I'm like, you're living 24 hours in the past. We literally had 16 holes yesterday and you're already, you know, two holes into the day. Like, what are you doing? And he played terrible because he literally was living in the past. We're all going to have bad shots. We're all going to do that. And the, the flip side too, though, when you're playing good, how many times have you said, oh, if I just par out, then I'm going to have 79. If I just par out, I'm going to have my best round ever. It's like you can't let your mind wander to the future either because then all of a sudden you're not going to commit. You're not going to go through your routine. You're going to have an uncommitted swing, and now all of a sudden you're trying to salvage it. And so mentally just staying as present as possible, wearing a rubber band, like – you know, doing something simple like that, just to constantly remind yourself like, hey, the past is the past. We can't change it. The future hasn't happened yet. Let's focus 100% on that shot because then you're going to have a clear mind and you're going to be able to actually execute your routine properly. And you're not going to take those, you know, heated decisions. Like, you know, if you did just three putt, a lot of times people on the next floor are like, oh, I'm going to play overly aggressive. I'm going to get one back. Stick to your game plan. Like play the percentages. Like there's nothing worse than three putting and then getting up. Maybe you have a drivable par four and you're like, oh, this isn't a driver hole, but today it is because I'm pissed off. I'm going to make it. And then all of a sudden a double bogey on the last hole turns into a bogey or a double on an easy hole. And you really just compounded the mistake from not staying present and making too emotional of decisions. So having that wherewithal to just slow down, take some deep breaths. Again, a lot of times we're out there, we, we really don't breathe regularly. And when we're not breathing regularly, the the brain gets worried. It's like, where's the oxygen? What are we doing? And so again, that's why the mental game really feeds into course management, because if your mind is stressed and panicked, you're not going to make the best decisions. So we have to keep that thing under control and keep it on a leash, if you will. So that way you can, you know, have the, uh, the time to actually execute the shot process and figure out what you need to do for the next shot. Yeah. I love it. That rubber band trick is so simple and so easy to do, right? It's, um, 
it's, it's something that so many people can just implement straight away. And if, if that was the one thing that they took away from this episode, then I, I think they're already going to start shooting better scores. But there's yeah, obviously man, a lot I, I remember that using it that, that next week when he told me that, and I started off at Q school with the worst bogey you've ever seen. I mean, I like thin top, no, not a top, but like thin to three wood, like 220. I normally at three wood, like 270, 260. Thin this thing, pulled the second one long in the worst spot, chipped over the green or chipped short, then putted down. I had to make like an eight footer for bogey, made it, thank God. And I was so nervous. And I literally remember on the next tee, just almost breaking the rubber band because I just snapped that thing. <laughs> and I was like, let's lock it up, Leonard. And so two holes later, I went par par birdie. And then I was like, oh, okay, we're good. But yeah, I mean, you this. can't. Yeah, you can't let the uh, avalanche of, of negative thoughts and everything else come at you. So hopefully I can remember all this stuff from my tournament tomorrow too. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure you'll be okay. You've written, <laughs> written a lot of words about it, so uh, practicing what you preach. And uh, I think a lot of people are going to have a, a rubber band like bruise or welt on their hand after the, the first time they work. play with that. So, Well, you know what? Um, I've, I've seen a lot of people do worse things themselves, myself included. I've punched a few steering yeah. wheels on golf carts and, you know, had to replace a few shafts in my day. So rubber bands are cheap. They're easy. <laughs> uh, cool. And um, the last thing I want to ask is on course management and, uh, oh, sorry, um, on what role uh, technology plays in course management. And uh, you mentioned just before um, Google Earth uh, and then a couple of other things. Um, what are some you know things in your tech stack that you currently use um, or what things do you recommend? Yeah, so I'm a big proponent of Decade Golf. That one literally changed my game. I know you had Scott on the podcast. Uh, for me, that system is just so easy to follow. It's definitely for more committed, serious golfers. Like it's, it's a lot to kind of take in, but to me, that's one of the best things to use. I still love just old school yardage book. Like I know a lot of people like golf GPSs, things like that, but I'm super geeky and uh, I love to have the yardage book, Google earth, you know, I'm measuring how wide fairways are measuring how uh, wide greens are things like that. But to me, it's really not about like more technology. It's really just having a game plan and having almost like a set of rules that you follow. It's, it's like technology is great and it's going to help with equipment. It's going to help with practice, you know, with the launch monitors and all the other great tools we have. But to me, it's, it's really just having the right decisions because you're not going to be able to use all this technology when you're out there. It's literally what you have. If you have a note in your phone, if you have a note card, if you have your yardage book, things like that. So for me, it's committing to having certain rules. Like if I have 200 plus yards, I only aim for the middle of the green or I only play a cut shot off the tee or just having these like things that you can follow. So that way you're not second guessing yourself. You're not wasting that mental energy out there. And that happens, of course, by doing all this ahead of time. You know, you got to have some sort of plan so that way you're not out there kind of guessing and testing. And you're going to figure you're obviously going to have to do that in some sense at the beginning of your journey or in practice rounds. But eventually you're going to figure out what works for you, what works for your swing. And you kind of want to follow those rules and, and just that way you don't have to make as many decisions. You know, we've all heard of decision fatigue. That's why all the CEOs wear the black T-shirts every day or whatever. It's like the same thing happens on the golf course. If you have to overly think about, oh, am I going to hit a draw on this one? Oh, do I aim for the flag on this one? Oh, do I do this? It's like when you have four or five rules that you just follow every single time and you do that homework ahead of time, it just makes golf a lot easier because you're not wasting so much mental energy. Yeah, 100%. And, I mean, there's so many tools out there. So – and they all give you know free trials and and test it out and do this and that so uh, my advice on that would just be to try a couple of them out in your practice rounds see which ones work really well for you and then incorporate it into what you're doing for your planning like you're saying there and um and i think part two of i guess when technology for course management is is having tracking your stats you know if you really want to get better and you're like committed you got to track your stats because that way technology will absolutely help you out because you might think, Oh, I drove it bad today, but the stats are going to you know, tell you differently. Or they're going to crunch the numbers for you because then you can actually change that stuff in practice. You know, so many times golfers love to work on their strengths in practice and they just avoid their weaknesses. But it's like, if you really want to get better, use technology, log your stats or use those trackers during the round, different apps. And then that way you're going to be like, Oh man, I really lost a lot of shots chipping today. Next week when you're out there practicing, spend some more time on the chipping green, like keep it simple. You got to, 
you got to work on your weaknesses in golf because when you're under pressure or you're in a tournament, that's when those things get exposed and you can't hide forever. So you really want to work on those. So that that's probably the best time to use technology. And it's not really during the round, but it's after the round when you're kind of crunching the numbers and, and you can actually look at everything objectively and figure out what your weaknesses are and, and what you need to improve. Cool, man. Well, uh, I'm aware of the time, so we'll wrap it up no, here. I talk all and... day with you, Sean. No worries. <laughs> well, mate, there's so many things that we can implement straight away into, you know, our, our pre-shot routine, mapping out courses, um, decision-making, um, post-shot routines, um, environmental factors to take into account. So there's so many actionable things in there. So thanks very much for providing all that. Um, where can people find you or, um, you know, read some of the work that you do? Um, let us know where we can uh, go and search you down. Yeah, so everything's uh, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Everything is at Wicked Smart Golf. Uh, so doing a lot of short form content these days, especially on TikTok, growing a lot there. And uh, the golf podcast, of course, is called Wicked Smart Golf. And then my book on Amazon, which is available in hard copy and uh, Kindle, and hopefully get the audio book up soon, also titled Wicked Smart Golf. And uh, I write for a lot of different clients. So if you really want to look at some of my uh, stuff there, you can basically, if you go on to wickedsmartgolf.com, uh, I have a link to some of my most popular articles that have really done well on course management, short game, mental game. And so I'll send you all the links so that way you have it. But if you want to follow the journey on social media, it is at Wicked Smart Golf. Amazing. Well, thanks again for your time, mate. Um, you guys listening, definitely go and check him out. And uh, we'll have to get you back on in the future for a um, for a round two. And we'll talk a bit more about the mental side of things. I know we carried over or sort of got caught between uh, mental strategy and, and course management a little bit there, but they've, they've got a lot of crossover. Uh, but next time we'll go straight into uh, the mental side. Oops, sorry, I think I lost you there, bud. That's what I just...